social engineering. Now you compare that with the American Bill of Rights, which is not part of the Constitution initially adopted, but it was part of the deal is as soon as the Constitution is adopted, these 10 amendments will get passed. And there was an argument. Some people said, well, the Constitution doesn't give the government these powers anyway. You don't need to list them. And if you list them, maybe people will think that this is an exhaustive list. But other people said, no, no, it's just for greater clarity, and they won the debate. So the Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. That phrase is missing from Clause 26 in our Charter. Then the Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or the people. Again, you look through the American um, Bill of Rights, it's a whole series of thou shalt nots. It is effective prohibitions on the government interfering with things that you're meant to have. So it doesn't just say you have a right to something. It says that you have a remedy, that the government is specifically barred from doing these things. And you go back to our Constitution, and you look at the guarantee of freedom of the press, for instance. Well, what does that mean? How does that work? Writing about Britain in the early 20, very early 20th century, what Dicey says about freedom of the press, he says there's no such thing as freedom of the press, this kind of weird abstract thing granted to us by our benevolent rulers. What there is in England is a prohibition on anybody stopping you from renting a piece of property, from purchasing printing equipment, from soliciting subscriptions and delivering papers. Uh, neither private people nor agents of the government can stop you from exercising these various rights in any combination that seems to you to work. And if they do, you can get writs and injunctions or you can sue them They're for tort. There's all kinds of remedies you have. These add together to the ability to publish a newspaper but not because it's some favored category of activity. Why should freedom of the press be singled out as a right? Why isn't it just a reflection of the right of people to speak their minds and their right not to be prevented from doing the things that amount to effective freedom of expression? So we need to go through our Constitution and, and fix these phrasings. They're not innocent. They are a, reflect the muddle of not being sure if rights come from the people or from the benevolent elite. And then, of course, you have the notwithstanding clause. You know, what's that about? Well, I'll, I'll explain, actually. It is a rearguard action by certain provincial premiers who thought the British system in which Parliament governs because people elect legislators should be protected from judicial activism and other forms of elite usurpation. So, uh, Trudeau didn't want to put it in, but he was eventually forced to put it in. But it only covers the core rights. I mean, this is how backwards it is. Uh, it covers things like free speech, freedom of conscience. It covers uh, protection against unreasonable search and seizure, but it doesn't affect affirmative action. That one, you can't invoke the notwithstanding clause. Um, Actually, no, I'll correct myself. So it does on affirmative action, but it doesn't on official languages and things like that. So the, not, you can only invoke the notwithstanding clause on important rights, not on secondary ones, which is weird. And then you have the dagger through the heart of the whole thing. At the very beginning, it says the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. A clause which says, here are your rights, now you don't have them, and nobody can tell you why or how. This is a procedural horror story. Justified to whom? How? Demonstrably. What does that even mean? You know, the, the American Constitution says the government shall not in, infringe, you know, pass no law infringing freedom of speech. Or, and, and there it is. You know, you know what can't happen. And that tells you what you can do. This one doesn't tell you what can't happen. It tells you anything can happen. And it doesn't tell you what you can do about it because you can't do anything about it. So, particularly in the presence of the Monarchist League, I want to emphasize that when I say we need to redo the Constitution and submit it to the people, I'm not suggesting that we need to abolish constitutional monarchy. Constitutional monarchy is a great system. I happen to think the American system is a great system too. And I have days when I think that the American rule that no member of the legislature can have an executive branch post is one that we need. If you look at a legislature today, including the Ontario legislature, and count the ministers, parliamentary secretaries, secretaries of state, you realize that the biggest group in the legislature most of the time is the executive branch group. 
And the legislature is never going to scrutinize the executive properly when so many people are in that magic thing called cabinet and have the power, and so many others are halfway up the greasy pole, and so many others are congregated around the base of it. One of the changes I would like to see, by the way, is to double the size of all the legislatures to make sure that a significant portion of the governing caucus cannot dream of being ministers. So they busy themselves instead on committees, scrutinizing estimates, and making the premier or prime minister's life miserable. That's how it's meant to work. The British House of Commons is over 600 members. And although Britain is not conspicuously better governed, that's one way in which they have better machinery. But the point of all of this is that in Canada, and by in Canada, I mean in Britain as well. I mean, going back to Magna Carta and beyond, law has all, fundamental law has always come from the people. And when legislators gather and make rules, they do so restricted by the people's fundamental rights, which they may not infringe. And we lost that in 1982 to sorcerer's apprentices. I don't think it was a conspiracy. I think it was people who had no idea what they were doing. Pierre Trudeau has a reputation as a great thinker. I have no idea why. He was <laughs> in a small pond as a young man, and he developed the habit of glibness. He was clever rather than wise, and nobody around him dared to tell him, you know, you know, you've read a lot of books, but they haven't left much of an impact on your thinking. And the fact that he didn't produce a radically bad constitution, or a radically good one, but a radically incoherent one, to me, is the final monument to, to the man. But monuments can be demolished. A final thought on all of this, we have, our country is the Constitution Act, 1982. Well, where do acts come from? Acts are passed by parliaments, right? So, how did the Constitution Act of 1982 become law? Is it an act of the British Parliament? No, if it were, the British Parliament could amend it. Is it an act of the Canadian Parliament? No, because if it were, the Canadian Parliament could amend it. Was it adopted by we the people in conventions? No. Okay, where did it come from? The premiers and the prime minister. But they can't create fundamental law. Technically, how did our constitution become law? Because if you ask the British, they could tell you, you know, we fought a civil war against Charles I, we made Parliament supreme. They could tell you how they got their system of government. You ask the Americans, we chased off the tyrannical King George III, and we the people made a constitution. How did we do it in Canada? Queen Elizabeth II signed it. Sign, just, but she, Queen Elizabeth could sign anything. She could sign an autograph, it wouldn't be law. <laughs> What happened? Nobody knows. Do you know? Pierre Trudeau. But, but, but he can't write something and have it be law. He's not the Tsar of Russia. In fact, the answer is, by letters patent, Queen Elizabeth made it law. And that is a clever dodge, but it is not a proper way for great people to make fundamental law. So, Letters patent. The Queen has this power to make proclamations with the force of law. But it doesn't mean the Queen is a tyrant, obviously. That doesn't work. It means that there are situations in which something so fundamental has to be done that it bypasses the institutions. And if that is done by a constitutional monarch because the people have authorized it, that is good law. But when it is done to implement a backroom deal whose amending formula is the most hideous evidence of how un- democratic in the good sense it was, how little it had to do with self-government and with law coming from the people. It is a kludge, and we shouldn't be governed by a kludge. It is bad in principle, it is bad in practice, and should we encounter another crisis in our Constitution, the lack of legitimacy of the process will permeate the ability of the structure to handle the problem. The American Constitution is a very robust document because its origins are so legitimate, and so is the British Constitution despite everything that's wrong in both those countries today, but ours is not, and we can fix that. And that is why I say, in order to fix the specific things that are wrong with our Constitution, we have to go to the root of the problem, which is that it does not come from the people, which the American and British Constitutions both did, and did necessarily. To have authority and legitimacy, a Constitution must emanate from the people, must come from the consent of the governed. That is an American principle because it was a British principle. And it is a Canadian principle that is not being observed at the moment by our Constitution. So that's my dream, Nick. And it's a preposterous dream. The odds are hugely long. You will be ridiculed if you say such a thing. But since you people are used to being ridiculed, when you don't have a positive, that's no obstacle.
the official scoring meter is often assigned that you're onto something. And so we, the people of Canada, should take back our constitution, fix it up, and then establish it as an expression of our sovereignty through Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We can do this, we should do this, it's hard work worth doing. And it takes us back to Magna Carta, which is exactly where we should be facing ourselves in order to get good government to this day.